Hey, this is Ocean K with an overview of Carve, a dynamic EQ ducker for Reason. So a dynamic EQ ducker is sort of like other EQs in that it cuts frequencies, but a normal EQ, like for instance the M-Class EQ, uh, when you want to cut something, you manually set the gain and the frequency and the bandwidth. Whereas a dynamic EQ ducker dynamically determines uh, what frequencies to cut and at what gain and what bandwidth and all of that. So what determines uh, what frequencies to cut? In this case, it's the frequencies present in a second audio signal. So let's hook that up and actually see how that works. We're going to start with a subtractor. Um, and we're going to bring up just the keyboard. And let's reset that. So we've just got a basic saw wave. Now uh, let's hook up our carve. And if we turn this around, we see that uh, carve is uh, manually routed, automatically routed. Uh, to go through this signal in and out. But there's a second set of uh, audio connections for ref or reference, all right? This determines what e uh, what frequencies to cut. So right now, if I play this subtractor, and we'll bring up the spectrum here, there's no EQ going on because there's no second audio source to tell Carve what to cut. And so in this case, it's not cutting anything. But let's go ahead and bring in a second subtractor. And we'll reset this. Now, uh, if we want to route this into the carve, uh, let's send the output to the mix channel and the input to in ref. Now, this is just a straight through. There's no processing happening on this. So this is would be just like if you were using a spider. Um, whatever goes in here comes out here with no latency and it doesn't change anything. The only thing Carve does is it looks at it and it analyzes this signal. And whatever's in that in this signal here, it's going to cut from this signal. So let's actually make this signal um, white noise. Um, uh, let us... There we go. And... Uh, so if we look at the frequency spectrum here, we see that subtractor gives us a relatively flat uh, white noise. You know, it's a little low on the uh, low end. It's just a little slope. But for the most part, this is, this is pretty decent white noise. Now, if from this subtractor, this subtractor, we play a note, and we can look at the frequency spectrum there, we'll see that this does just a few overtones, uh, just like you know what we would expect for a saw wave. We also see that the reference shows up here. And in fact, this signal looks remarkably similar to this signal. Um, and so this is Carve saying, oh, I'm analyzing what's coming into the reference, and this is what I'm seeing is coming into the reference. There are actually two charts here, one in the blue and one in the white. And we'll talk about the difference between those in just a second. But right now, we're actually only paying attention to the blue. In this case, we can see this blue matches this. All right, so if I go back to our white noise, and I'm going to bring the release all the way up. So when I play a note here and release it, it just keeps playing because I want to send notes here as well. If I send, uh, if I start playing notes from here, all right, so you see this is the white noise, right? When I don't play a note, it doesn't cut anything. When I do play a note, it cuts that. So how is, why does it cut right there instead of somewhere else? Well, if I look at the frequency of what I'm playing, there's that tonic, right? So if I play that, it cuts that little bit from the white noise. And so if I change what notes I'm playing, right? So whatever notes I'm playing is actually what it's cutting from that white noise. Okay, so now you can see what I mean when I say car is an EQ and it EQs this signal, but instead of manually setting what frequencies it cuts and at what gain uh, and all that stuff, um, 
it actually determines from a second audio signal, in this case, this subtractor, it analyzes the audio from this subtractor and uses that to cut from this audio signal. Now, just a, a few other things. You can set, by default, um, we're going to bring that white noise back, and then we're going to go back and start playing this. There's audio that's happening all along here, but what if we only wanted to cut this bit? Right? Well, we've got a brick wall, high pass, and low pass. So even though there are overtones here, it's not going to cut. So the blue graph is the analysis of the audio signal that's coming in, and the white graph is the actual cut that's happening. So in this case, it's only cutting this peak. And if we play this higher, right, it's not cutting anything because these are brick wall limiters, right? And so it's not cutting anything except what's in between those two lines, right? Amount is the amount of the cut. So it's essentially, do you want to cut it by, you know, half or the whole uh, amplitude of what's coming in or even more? Um, so that's just that. And then we've also got an attack and release. So you can have a slow attack. Let's bring this back up. You can have a slow attack and a slow release, very slow, um, a fast attack and a slow release, right? So you can figure out the dynamics of the cut itself. And so that's what this is. The high pass, the low pass for that brick wall limiting. So if you only want to dynamically cut one portion of the frequency range, and we've got a mount that just uh, says how much of the cut do you want to happen and then attack and release. All right. So that's sort of the basic uh, to understand how it's actually happening. Let's look how that might work in a real world example. So let's bring in how about uh, just a basic drum loop and let's bring in a second um, Octo Rex, um, and let's see if we can come up with um, how about we're going to bring in a bass loop. How about a bass loop? Um, yeah, we'll do that. Okay. Okay. So if we play these together, all right. Now let's just play. Oops. So this is our uh, drum loop. And so we see we have a kick drum here, and we've got a snare drum here, and then we've got hi-hat stuff going on here, right? All right. Uh, if we play our bass loop, so we've got our basic tonic down here, right? And then we've got all that extra stuff that's happening up here. So if we play both of these together, we can see that bass tonic here, and we can see that kick drum here. They're, they're fighting for frequency space just a little bit. And so one way that we'd want to deal with that is we could just EQ, you know, the bass drum, and we can just cut it right there, right? If we do this, we could, right, just cut this out. And so in that case, anytime the bass drum, uh, the kick drum plays, you know, it's got space to do it. But even when the kick drum isn't playing, we're still knocking this part of that bass loop out, you know, which, you know, maybe we don't want to. Maybe the kick is only, the kick isn't all that frequent. And so in between all of those kick drums, we're just missing bass opportunities, right? Um, and so one way we can deal with that is if we want to cut out, we want to knock part of the bass, but only when the kick drum is playing, then we want to dynamically EQ this bass loop. So we'll set up a carve and it's just automatically routed into our signal. And then we want to route this drum loop through our reference carve. And so let's just, um, we can just do it that way, right? So now when we play this loop, we can see this stuff going on. Now we only want to carve the kick drum. And so the kick drum is essentially down there, right? 
Now this is a, we don't want to overdo it, we just want to knock down it just a little bit. And we want a you know, pretty fast attack and release because we want to get that EQ out of the way as soon as it uh, can be. So now if we play these two together, now this is the uh, bass loop that we're looking at here. So notice that in the very beginning, where, that, where the kick drum is also playing, it's pretty low. But the next time it pumps up here, bum, bum, higher, right? That's higher because a kick drum isn't playing there. So that first bump, 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 right? So that bump, bump is pretty low, but that next one's high. That's because those first drums, there's still that kick drum going on, but that bump, 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 that part, there isn't a kick drum. And so our bass loop is able to pop back up into the frequency range. And so what happens is if you have two audio signals that are at the same frequency range, they're going to compete with each other. And so part of mixing and mastering is you figure out how to how to fix those muddy areas where different instruments are trying to compete. And so often you'll just have to knock out a part of a frequency uh, range for some instrument. But here we've got two instruments and we've got a kick drum and a bass loop and they're sharing the same area here, but now they're totally living in harmony because anytime that kick drum is actually playing, that, that beginning bump, bump, right? The, our bass loop just drops down. But once our kick drum stops playing, that bass loop comes back up, right? So it's it, they're very nicely living together, and you eliminate a lot of muddiness because you don't have instruments competing for space. All right? So that's what I think the magic of Carve is all about. It's really getting different instruments to, to really play well together. You can certainly use Carve to make interesting sounds, uh, you know, and, and, and EQ uh, sounds in ways that you can't EQ in other ways. So as a sound creation tool, you can certainly use it for that. But really the, the heart and soul of what Carve is about is when you're mixing things together to deal with all of that muddiness of instruments trying to compete. Now, um, just as a side note, um, the a few people have wondered, isn't this what sidechain compression does? Isn't this just the same thing? And it's not, because a si sidechain compressor, if you wanted this, um, the, the bass drum to trigger some sidechain compression, every time a bass drum hits, the entire frequency spectrum would be compressed. So all of this stuff up here would also be affected by that kick drum, even though the kick drum is just down here. And so... Um, and so the, the compression it just has a very, very different effect. Now you can do things with like multi-band compressors where a compressor might have, you know, three or four or five bands. And so maybe one of the bands is just this area and you can compress just this area. But this area has a lot of stuff going on. And if you really only want to deal with the, the, the frequencies in this one area to have to compress this whole thing is just overkill. Uh, Carve has a 48 band EQ processor to it. And so in some ways it's it's similar a little bit to like a 48 band multi-band compressor, uh, which as far as I know doesn't exist. I, I've seen you know three or four or five band compressors, but there's I've never seen anything like a 48 band compressor. And and also, even if there was a 48 band compressor, Compression is very different than EQing. EQing is just about the gains and boosts of a frequency uh, band, whereas a compressor actually compresses the dynamic range of that band. So even if there was such a thing as a 48-band compressor, uh, it would just have a very different effect. It would be compressing the bands instead of EQing and just uh, cutting and boosting those bands. So um, it's certainly in the in the same family of processors of effect units that use one signal to change the audio of another signal, um, but they do it in very, very different ways and they have, you know, very different uses. So, uh, you know, if you have a multi-brand compressor or just any sidechain compression that you use, you know, Carve is, is really not duplicative of that at all. And if you like Carve and you're using Carve, um, you know, you should also absolutely explore sidechain compression because both are really useful when doing mixing and mastering. Okay, so that's Carve. I hope you like it. Uh, if you have any questions, just uh, uh, email me at reinfo 
uh, at OceanK.com. Otherwise, just go to the uh, uh, Propellerhead shop and you'll see my contact info there. Otherwise, have fun. <laughs>